Welcome to this OR Live webcast presentation from Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Pushing the clinical and academic envelope is our mission here at Wake Forest Baptist. Ranked as one of America's best hospitals in U.S. News and World Report, we bring together the best of patient care, research, and education. Our faculty members are internationally recognized as leaders in their respective fields, and our patients receive the benefits of their medical knowledge and expertise. We provide patients of all ages with top-notch medical care, often reaching beyond the walls of the medical center to help members of the community maintain healthy living. Teaching and learning are the mantra our physicians, surgeons, and healthcare professionals live by, truly showing that at Wake Forest Baptist, knowledge makes all the difference. During the program, it's easy for you to make referrals, make appointments, or request more information. Just click on the buttons on your screen and open the door to informed medical care. OR Live, the vision of improving health. Good afternoon and welcome to Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center. My name is Dr. Christopher Tui. I'm an orthopedic surgeon here at Wake Forest. We want to welcome the viewers for joining us for this webcast. Today we're going to be demonstrating a total shoulder replacement. Just as a short reasoning for this, this is a procedure performed on patients with shoulder pain uh, from arthritis in their shoulder. I'd like to remind viewers who have questions that they can send emails anytime by clicking the forum access button on their screen. We want to begin by introducing you to Dr. Ethan Wiesler, another orthopedic surgeon here at Wake Forest University. Dr. Wiesler will bring us up to speed now on today's patient and where we are at this point in the procedure. So um, thank you, uh, Chris. We have a gentleman here, a 59-year-old fellow with uh, shoulder arthritis, and we have him uh, in the operating room under general anesthesia. He also has a scalene catheter block to help assist with the uh, anesthetic as well as with postoperative pain. And he's in a seated position, and the arm has been prepped and draped, and we're, just, we're going to get started. This is a uh, delta pectoral incision. It's called delta pectoral because it utilizes the intermuscular plane between the deltoid muscle and the pectoralis major. And um, we'll start uh, showing some anatomy as we, after we get down through some of the uh, some of the soft tissue proximally here. It's a knife on the mayo. Okay. Well, let's take a look at the slide here of the anatomy, which will be uh, helpful in terms of seeing exactly what's going on. Um, the approach that they're talking about using here is between the deltoid, which is a large muscle on the outside. It gives a nice contour to the shoulder. And, uh, and the medial uh, muscle, which delphi. is the pectoralis major. Um, they will find the split between that area, which is a natural plane um, that will be identified by uh, the cephalic vein. And you can see that here on this uh, slide here that we have. Um, on the right side, it'll go, basically we have some pictures here of the anterior bony anatomy, and, and it's a little bit detailed, but the point of the matter is what we're talking about replacing here is basically the, uh, the ball and the socket portion of the shoulder. So, Ethan, uh, with the cephalic vein, where do you like to typically take it? Do you uh, prefer to take it medially or laterally? Uh, typically we take the cephalic vein laterally because it, it drains the deltoid. Okay. And um, so we're just going to mobilize some of these branches here and move the, move the vein over to the lateral side. Okay, well, they're doing that. Let's talk a little bit about uh, who are the patients that we, uh, we typically do uh, replacements on. And that, that, that'll be, you can see that on our indication slide here. Shoulder arthritis is typically the patient that has this kind of, uh, kind of replacement done. Um, it involves replacing the glenohumeral joint, and, and that the glenoid is the socket portion of the shoulder, and the humerus is the large ball part of the shoulder. The primary indications for this are osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, sometimes we'll do it for trauma. It depends on the situation, uh, how bad the fracture is. Typically, in that case, we don't replace the socket at the same time. Um, and then two of the other indications may be for post-traumatic, meaning they have a fracture that doesn't heal or for a, for a failed instability surgery, which basically means that patients have had chronic dislocations for a long time. 
Another slide we can talk about here while they're getting going, going through is the evaluation of how you determine uh, who, who, we, uh, who we consider are good, uh, good candidates for a shoulder replacement. Um, when the patient comes in, we talk to them a little bit about their history, the, uh, the pain that they have, the nature of it. Typically, most shoulder patients will complain of uh, significant pain at night. They have difficulty sleeping. We usually examine for range of motion and their uh, functional assessment of this. Uh, Ethan, is there anything in particular you, uh, you worry about with range of motion or functional assessment of your patients? Yeah, definitely. You know, we um, want patients to have surgery to regain motion that they've typically lost with arthritis, but at the same time, there are some factors that if patients have significant loss of preoperative range of motion, that ends up being a factor in the, um, in the soft tissue structures that we um, are trying to release as we get into the shoulder here. So here we're just getting into a little bit of bleeding from some of the deep branches of the cephalic vein. There's a little branch right there. Hopefully we can get, fix that up right here. So, so the deltoid there is on the, uh, I guess, the right uh, side of the screen. And uh, the pectoralis is there on the left. And uh, where that, that instrument is right now, they're trying to get control of a little bit of bleeding from a little branch that's... Do you have a right angle here? Not making, uh, not, not getting along and being appropriate for us here. Additionally, for the history, you want to know prior surgery, uh, which you can see on the evaluation slide here. Uh, basically, if they've had surgery before, you want to know where the incisions are so that they can... Uh, guide what you need to do and and uh, it, you know it helps in terms of knowing that uh, what other kinds of problems they may have when you're uh, doing the surgery and uh, other medical problems um, certainly uh, folks uh, that are not able to walk normally or use assistive devices um, that, uh, you want to uh, make sure you know that in terms of how well they'll be able to do their rehab and then the final thing you always want to keep in mind is just uh, people with chronic pain issues because that may not be solvable by the uh, shoulder replacement. Certainly one other thing that should be you know, mentioned, as you said, is um, other, other areas around the shoulder that can contribute to pain. Okay, you can take that out. The neck, neck issues can sometimes be a, a factor around the shoulder that can be radiating down. Um, no, you can leave it on there for now. That's fine. So we have to, you know, want to make sure that we're obviously doing the right operation for the right reason because sometimes other factors in their patient's uh, history and medical situation can be contributing to their shoulder discomfort, Absolutely. even though it's not pertaining to the shoulder per se. So right now we're dissecting um, down here to the top. This is the pectoralis muscle. This is the deltoid muscle. And so now we're just relieving, releasing some of this uh, fascia. That's the pickups, Harry. And scissors. Now, what are we seeing there deep in that between the uh, pectoralis and deltoid? So here's the top of the pectoralis muscle. This is some of the fascia called the clavipectoral fascia. Okay. And this is going to take us down to a structure called the conjoint tendon, which is the uh, confluence of the uh, break, uh, the coracobrachialis and the short head of the biceps. Okay. So let's take that up there. That's great. Thanks. So let's look at the radiographic evaluation slide that we have here just to give people an idea of what, kind, what, what, what we look at when we see them. Um, when we see patients, we'll typically get three views or four views of their shoulder. Uh, they include a uh, front view or an AP, a lateral view, which is from the side, and an axillary view, which is kind of a view up through the armpit. And you can see that's, the, that's here in the bottom slide. Uh, the, probably the most used, two useful views of all that, though, are the AP slide, which shows clearly the arthritis, which is the top slide here, and then the axillary view, uh, which importantly helps define the socket portion of the joint. For some folks, uh, if they have significant socket wear, they may not be a candidate for a total shoulder replacement. They can have the ball replaced, but the socket may not be reconstructable because of the amount of bone loss that they've had. If that's a question about whether or not... Uh, that that's a feasible thing to do. We'll often get a CAT scan to evaluate the socket portion better uh, to help define that before surgery. So, Ethan, you've gotten the conjoined tendon, it looks like, out of the way. Right, so we're just now, uh, now we should be able to get to the um, shoulder itself. So now what's, what's, yeah. uh, what's hiding us uh, from the, uh, the ball? Yeah. 
So right now, the next thing we're going to be looking at is um, the lateral margin of the conjoint tendon. And you can see these vessels right here. It's a fairly consistent um, vessels right here. I don't know if the camera can picture that. That's the circumflex, humeral circumflex vessels, anterior and posterior humeral circumflex. You can go ahead and close through that. Excuse me, the uh, ascending anterior humeral circumflex vessels and artery and veins. Typically, there's two artery, two veins in an artery. There. And then the next structure that we're going to get to deep here is the. Um, you can just relax on this. Let's take one of these. So sometimes folks, way. sometimes folks will call those the three sisters. Kind of, kind of remember that. Kind of like the Diana Ross and the Supremes, I guess. Uh, so, So now we're continuing to elevate this uh, clavipectoral fascia here, which is the lateral margin of the con just under the conjoined tendon. So at this point, we uh, we have we've done most of the superficial dissection of the delta pectoral uh, exposure, and we're getting down really to the next major part of the exposure for the here. for humeral exposure. And uh, once Dr. Weasel here gets the uh, those vessels. Um, cauterized, uh, he'll be probably, he'll be looking for the biceps tendon. All right, and then the biceps tendon is right adjacent to the, uh, another tendon that's sort of our window into the anterior shoulder called your subscapularis, and that's where we're looking for right here. If you could rotate the arm a little bit, Roy, back and forth. So there's bicepital groove right there. And uh, suction here. So what I'm going to try to do now is find the uh, bicycle of view. And then make a, a release of the uh, subscapularis tendon. I need to get a little bit of retractor here. So just to kind of give the uh, viewers here an idea of, of what he's talking about, the rotator cuff uh, basically has four parts. Uh, the subscapularis is the front, it's the only front part to the rotator cuff. There's three other portions that are uh, uh, on top and in the back, which include the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor. Those, uh, those we don't have to deal uh, with during this procedure other than making sure that we don't uh, cause any injury to them. But the subscapularis, as Dr. Weisler said, is, it's known as the uh, front door to the shoulder or the window into the shoulder. Sure. And uh, we need to uh, take that down off the front of the shoulder so that we can uh, perform the rest of the procedure. Okay. Now, there are a couple of ways you can do that. Um, you can actually take the uh, subscapularis directly off the bone, the or uh, you can cut the bone on the front. Uh, Dr. Weisler, do you have a preference on how you like to do that? Yeah, there are, there, like you said, there are different ways to do it. I the biomechanically strongest way to do it is actually do an osteotomy where you remove the bone, the sliver of bone. Um, I've, I've gone to using a, just a tendon release like we're doing here. Right. Um, I find that gives you adequate tendon here to reattach and adequate tendon here to reattach at the end of the case. Okay. So this is that subscapularis tendon in the front of the shoulder. We just basically take this right down. There's, now we're pretty safe here. There's really no other major structures at risk, and we're, this is going to take us right down to the shoulder joint itself. And that's a good point that he points out. Surprisingly, this, this area of the shoulder uh, is fairly uh, safe. I mean, th there's one nerve down in the most inferior portion of here that is deep, which you won't be actually able to see. Uh, that's the nerve that we kind of keep an eye on during the procedure called the axillary nerve. Um, and normally, you won't, you won't see it during the procedure. Uh, unless you go looking for it in particular. And what you can see here too, Chris, I don't know if the camera can see this here, but you have the big bone spur. Absolutely. See that rough area right there? That's indicative of the, uh, the arthritis that's contributing to this gentleman's problem. And it's, it's fairly peripheral in the joint, but if it's here, it's also a fairly good chance that there's a osteophyte formation in other parts of the shoulder joint. Absolutely. I can see that, I can see that very well, actually. And you can sort of, under, you can sort of imagine having a big piece of extra bone like that sticking out of the uh, ball portion of the uh, shoulder is going to be quite painful for the patient. The other part that we'll get to see eventually here that's important to appreciate is, is the cartilage, which is the surface of the, uh, the head and the socket, is going to be significantly worn away. 
And that cartilage is basically the smooth surface that keeps the bearings gliding as well as they need to. What we're doing here, we're just releasing some of the tissue around the uh, joint capsule to just get exposure to the joint itself. And now that I think we've done that, we may need to do a little more release on the inferior portion right here, but you can take out that retractor. I think we need just a hair more right there. We're going to hold that suction. So now when you do this, obviously, Dr. Weiser, you're releasing the anterior and the inferior portion of the capsule. Right. What do you tell your patients in terms of the range of motion that you expect to get back well, based on those releases? Yeah, hopefully they will get back. Let's take out this Mayo stand. Hopefully they'll get back range of motion because it's been so contracted. And so just let them go for a second. So um, you can see now, let's take this out. You can see now this very roughened humeral sponge, please. Humeral head. This is the smooth surface that Dr. Tui just said is it's actually supposed to be smooth. It's really not very smooth. You can see how very roughened the uh, joint surface is. This part right here, you can see it's just amazing. Um, flattened, it's lost its round contour. Have a ronger, please. Absolutely. Um, so this bone spur here is probably contributing to some of his pain and limited range of motion. The cartilage here is not smooth and shiny like normal. So all of this contributes to a painful, uh, sh painful joint and uh, loss of range of motion. And so this, just removing these bone spurs will help us identify what's his normal anatomy so that we can kind of get things back together at the end of this case. This will, be, this will serve as our tendon for reattachment at the end. Now, you already removed the biceps tendon, right, or did you leave that alone? Well, we haven't got there yet. We're going to look okay. at it here in just a minute. Okay. Have a Fukuda retractor. You can and, come on and this just right now. to give the viewers a sense of uh, the cartilage, the cartilage normally is just a, it's a pearly white surface, literally. And, in, in you know, if you had a 16-year-old patient that you're looking at, the surface of that, uh, that head would look like basically a pearl um, instead of that roughened um, red uh, surface that you're seeing there, mm -hmm. uh, which is all related to the, the inflammation and all the changes that take place okay, in the cartilage. Now we need the entry, entry reamer, please. So not only does the surface lose its smooth um, gliding surface, but it also um, becomes flattened and irregularly shaped. Absolutely. You can so right now we're going to start accessing the humeral canal with a, a device. I probably need a mallet, Harry. This is just a reamer, a hand reamer. We try to, you don't, you don't use too much. Maybe you need a drill actually here to start this with. You have a, you have a drill. Oh, never mind, we got it. So how do you know where to put that, uh, that device there? So this is actually in the center portion, right at the edge of the articular margin, sort okay. of center, front and back. Okay. And um, I just wanna, yeah, that's great. And then basically the rest of it just sort of falls down the canal. So this is right down the intramedullary canal of the humerus. Okay. And so you can see looking at the camera here, there's a, there's a retractor that's, that's back behind them. And, and back there is going to be where the rotator cuff is, uh, where the main, the main other portion is the rotator cuff that I mentioned earlier, the supraspinatus. And you're, you, you will not, definitely not see the infraspinatus of the teres minor. That ends up being on the posterior or the back portion of the... Uh, the uh, greater tuberosity. Uh, up the arm just a little bit more. So at this point, they're, uh, they're basically opening up the canal uh, down the humerus, uh, and then they will progress along uh, to opening up the canal a little more and, and then making a cut on the humeral head uh, so that they can begin the uh, humeral uh, replacement portion. So we're just sequentially opening this up to accommodate the uh, proper size. As one may imagine, everybody's a little different. So we have a number of different sizes. All of these change by one millimeter. This is a nine millimeter diameter. And we're trying to find the right size for this patient, trying to engage what is cancellous bone and remove the cortical bone. The, uh, engage the cortical bone, remove the cancellous bone. So that's actually pretty good. I think we might just go one more. So this is all part of the humeral component preparation. This is a 10 regular. Now, Dr. Weisler, do you, uh, do you just pound this implant in? Do you cement it? What's your, what's your uh, preference about that? Yeah, there are different ways. Um, patients with good bone, this gentleman has very good bone, and oftentimes um, 
can accommodate a prosthesis without, re without requiring cement. Okay. So in this case, um, we're not going to use cement. The prosthesis that this company, Biomet, makes has a porous coating on it that we'll show you in a minute that allows for some bony ingrowth. And that um, helps stabilize the prosthesis in the long run, in the, long, in the, in the body's healing process. So if you, uh, if you show the camera here, I can demonstrate what he's talking about, that ingrowth uh, that's on the stem. And that lines up there. I'm going to drop that down a little bit more. So, uh, so basically, this is the implant that we have right here. And basically, you can see on the top here, um, there's this, this coating that's on here. That coating actually is... Uh, designed so that bone will grow into it. And that's what Dr. Weisler was talking about in, uh, in terms of helping stabilize it. Um, we also were talking a couple minutes ago about cement. It's, cement ends up being sort of a grouting agent that we use uh, that, that often we'll have to use in terms of uh, patients with bone that's not so good. And then the other time that we'll use it is in fractures um, because the amount, of, the amount of bone that may be lost requires us to position the stem in a way in a position, a static position, and the cement helps us to do that. Yeah, right at the edge of the margin, that looks pretty good right there. So this device allows us to cut a fairly precise um, cut on the humerus to remove the arthritic head. We have a, this mimics the saw cut. We want to preserve all the rotator cuff. So this is a, um, a cutting guide that sort of makes it a little less freehand, uh, really a very good stable guide through which the saw can cut. You'll see that here in just a minute. We're just uh, provisionally affixing this cutting device, cutting guide, if you will. And now we'll remove all these other tools here so we can disengage and uh, perform our cut after we remove this intermedullary implant. That's a little bit tight here. We'll probably have to... So some of the specifics with this are basically uh, different designs do different things. Um, this one is, is a guide that's based off of the, uh, the instrument that's placed down the canal. Uh, some of them can be based on, uh, on basically the surgeon basically performing a free, what we call a freehand cut, basically. And that'd be kind of like if you, if you were cutting a piece of plywood with a jigsaw, um, you don't really have something that's controlling what you're cutting. Basically, your hand drives how you're cutting it. The, dev the device down the canal gives a uh, stable platform to help you cut it, uh, kind of similar to if you were using a miter saw, if somebody knows what that is, or if you're using basically a table saw where it cuts specifically down at an angle. And that's, that's the advantage to that design. So he's cut off the head, and he'll pass that off actually to the back table. And that's actually important for us to keep a hold of, because it'll actually provide us with a template to pick the appropriate head size uh, for the implant. And uh, may be able to show that once he gets it cut off there. Uh, one, to help you see the cartilage a little bit better and see how badly it's worn. Uh, but then additionally, uh, it, it'll give you a sense of what the size of the implant's going to be. And uh, if you show, if you pan over here, I can show you what, what the metal implant's going to look like here. And... Uh, this is right here, and basically they will just size that up, kind of like a puzzle piece to that piece that he's cutting out. And uh, he probably, and Dr. Weiser probably has that cut out now at this point that we can probably show that. It's just attached with some uh, some some soft some tissue there. Soft tissue here in the back. Okay. You have some Mayo scissors, please here. There it goes. So what's interesting when you, when you see what he's doing here is that basically it's a pretty, uh, a pretty flat piece of uh, bone that he's cut out. And a lot of that has to do with what Dr. Weisler was saying is that um, with, along with the arthritis and the cartilage changes, you'll see the, uh, the roundness goes away and how flat it becomes, which is definitely different than that, uh, that metal implant that I was just showing you. Um, in a normal head, there's, a, there's, a, there's a definitely a... Uh, a greater roundness to it, um, but but the height of that roundness it will depend uh, on patient to patient. 
So here's, an, here's what the arthritis, arthritic head looks like. It's very flattened. Surfaces are very rough. Areas where there's completely devoid of cartilage. Uh, and again, again, the loss of the contour is also critical, but you can see all this is just osteophyte. So that's sort of uh, part one of uh, kind of the humeral preparation. We're going to now direct our attention to the glenoid, which is the socket side. And um, it's going to take us a few minutes just to get some some exposure here is sort of the challenging part of shoulder replacement surgery is this next step here to get all our proper exposure. So as he was saying, that what makes this particularly challenging is that the glenoid, it, the glenoid is basically uh, located uh, more towards the head and uh, the bone of the humerus, which I just cut, is, is still sort of in the way. So they'll use a special retractor to pull that, uh, pull that humeral head out or, Pull, pull what's left of the humerus and the shaft out of the way uh, to help expose, expose the glenoid. Do you have the, the glenoid uh, ribbon retractor here, please? One of the things that tends to be particularly challenging about this part of the procedure is, um, as, as Dr. Wiesler pointed out earlier, uh, when people have significant arthritis, uh, the capsule, which is the balloon portion right around the joint, becomes very tight. When that's the case, uh, the arm will tend to lose its range of motion, but additionally, that range of motion makes it difficult uh, to get exposure because, the, w because basically it's, it's tight and it's preventing you from externally rotating or bringing the arm out to see the uh, socket portion uh, on the inside. One of the first things that they'll be doing is, besides getting the exposure of the socket joint, they're also gonna uh, clean off uh, some of the outer labrum, or the uh, basically, there it's it's some cartilage, out soft cartilage that's on the outside of the uh, socket portion of the joint. That may be a little hard to see uh, here. It, of, it often is uh, hard for anybody to see during the procedure, other than really the primary surgeon looking in there. The structures that you mentioned, the, uh, the labral tissue, uh, the osteophytes. We have a little vein there. Now, just as a sense of understanding what the labrum is. Can have a bent homan, please? The way we, the way we, we uh, try to explain that is, is, is basically the shoulder uh, is a ball that sits essentially on a tee, like a golf tee. So there's really not much tight uh, connection between the two other than all the soft tissues. The hip joint, in contrast, is quite different. It's a ball that sits quite deep into a dish. Right angle, please. And so the labrum is an important structure that helps keep the shoulder located, uh, even though it doesn't seem like much of a structure. And it's often the one that's torn uh, when people have dislocations. So we're just working slowly, like you said, this area on the bottom here. It's probably very hard for the viewers to see. So, do you, so, Dr. Weiser, do you have anything down there or you know kind of where that axillary nerve is that we talked about before? Right. So this um, curved retractor behind my right hand here is a, called the Bennett retractor. And it's basically protecting the uh, posterior structures, the axillary nerve. So just for the viewers to know, the, the axillary nerve is an important nerve uh, for the shoulder. It innervates one portion of the rotator cuff called the teres minor. And it additionally innervates the deltoid, which is the large muscle on the outside contouring the shoulder, which we mentioned earlier. Uh, the, shoulders, the shoulders basically consist of uh, two groups of muscles. There's the strong outside muscles, like the deltoid, and then there's the small uh, controller, fine controllers of the shoulder that are inside, which is the rotator cup, which we talked about. So, Dr. Weisler. Can you raise the table for us, please? So we're now just uh, trying to work our way. He does have some of those bone spurs that we talked about. And we're now just trying, it's good. Uh, we're just trying to get our view here of the, uh, of the socket, the glenoid, so that we can do the socket replacement part. He has a very significant arthritis on the socket as well. Can I have that Fukuda retractor back here, please? So maybe now with the... I don't know if the camera has a shot, and that's okay. We're good for right now. So um, that, 
the glenoid that you're looking at in there, is there, does it look pretty flat in terms of the wear, or is there a lot of deformity of it? There is a little bit of deformity. You know, the x-rays that we looked at in the um, clinic, you can go ahead and cut that there. There's our biceps tendon. That, another structure in the shoulder that will we'll attach later on, but this is another structure in the shoulder that can contribute to pain in a lot of folks, so I think that's going to help him a lot, too. And he does have a lot of wearing on his glenoid. Can I have a, a coker and a long handle knife, please? Now, you just cut the biceps tendon there, and I'd just point out to everybody that the biceps, hence by, has two portions of it. One portion attaches within the shoulder joint, which is the portion he just cut, and there's a portion that attaches outside the shoulder joint, uh, which we don't cut. So 50% of it's... The of biceps right there that you just mentioned, that's the short head. Right, exactly. Where we have the retractor in. So, do you, um, do you, you know, typically blade, you know, typically, typically always cut the biceps? Yeah, it's, it really is a structure that doesn't really have a lot of shoulder function. It just has the propensity to cause uh, symptoms and of pain in the shoulder. I'll take that ten blade while you have it, though. Just what, give me what you got there. And I agree with you 100% about that. One of the things that you can't necessarily appreciate looking at this is that biceps tendon that goes inside the joint actually uh, sits in a groove outside the shoulder in the beginning portion of the procedure. And often with all the scarring that happens with the uh, arthritis, it becomes scarred and does not glide in that groove well, in which case that can be another source of pain that Dr. Wieser was alluding to. Yeah, indeed. It's, it's just something we see on the inside of the shoulder when we do arthroscopy. Um, it's a very, very common clinical problem. So what we're just starting to do here is continuing to work around the periphery of the labrum and, um, and to get all this sort of soft tissue out of the way so that we can get our visualization of the socket a little bit better, both front and back, because we really do have to have a straight-on shot at it. And this is just removing some of this labral, uh, redundant labral tissue. Can you have a squirt of irrigation, Harry, please? So, Dr. Weiser, what would be the advantage here of replacing the socket or just, or what I should say is, what's the advantage here to doing the socket and the head versus just doing the head? Yeah, that's a good question. That, that's a debate that remains ongoing in the shoulder literature and in the shoulder people. Typically, if the arthritis in, in young people, the, uh, the, the weak link in the chain of shoulder replacement surgery has been, um, has been the socket stability. It's probably going to be a medium. And so... Um, We've been woefully inadequate, probably, at designing the best implants to help um, stably and long and have a good lifespan of the socket replacement. And so we've gotten better in instruments, better implants, better cements, etc. So I need also a quarter-inch curved osteotome. So, and so, by and large, I think if, if the socket has arthritic changes in, in it, it really makes a lot of sense to try to replace it because now the implants are better, they last longer. And more importantly, patients get really much better pain relief with uh, total shoulder replacement, which, uh, I'm sorry, I need a half inch, I'm sorry, a half inch. <laughs> when we place the ball and the socket as opposed to just the, so uh, just the ball, the humeral head itself. Thank you. Corey, if you can hit that. So uh, just for the viewers to kind of understand, the socket portion it ends up being just a basically a, almost like a dish. I've got an example here of it. Um, and this is basically just replacing the dish portion that they're going to, smooth down a little bit here in the beginning. And you can imagine that dish, uh, if, it, if you have a ball loading heavily on one side or the other, it's going to cause that to basically get loose over time, which is the concern that uh, we've had over the years in terms of making sure the glenoid lasts a long time. In particular, patients that uh, are not good candidates if, uh, for that are people with significant rotator cuff tears. And the reason, the reason for that is is the rotator cuff keeps the uh, keeps essentially if you let me get this together here real quick. The rotator cuff will essentially keep that ball centered on that socket um, from the four points that it has. If a portion of it's torn in the front here, or torn up top, or torn in the back, then it will tend to cause the ball to ride onto the edge there. I think you could probably see something like that. And basically what we've determined then is for folks that have a big rotator cuff tear, they're usually not candidates for, uh, for a replacement that includes the socket. The other obvious person that we usually talk about with that too, which Dr. Wiesler was mentioning, is uh, in young patients. And the reason why is because young patients will tend to 
use that shoulder a lot more, and they may wear that, that socket glenoid plastic portion out uh, before, uh, before their life. So the final portion sometimes that we decide just to replace the ball in is sometimes we have folks that are young and they're laborers and they want to get, they want to get back to work. And uh, again, based on how hard they work, they may actually wear out that plastic sock socket portion uh, very quickly. What's your feeling about that, Dr. Weisler, in terms of your uh, young 50-year-old laborer that comes in to see you, but he's got terrible arthritis of his shoulder? Yeah, it's, it's a real challenge. I mean, you bring up a good point. It's been a long skinny round your hair. So, you know, we've been, we, like I said, we've been, we've been very reluctant to go down the road of replacing the sockets in young people just because we don't know how long they're going to last. And, um, but nowadays, I think that the uh, implants have been better designed. Um, the, the, the fixation techniques are better, so the loosening issue that was a major problem with the prosthesis some time ago is really much less of a problem. So I really think that we've sort of changed our paradigm a little bit such that we're a little more, you know, aggressive is the word, but a little more um, likely to go down the road of replacing both the, the ball and the socket in younger people because, number one, they get so much better pain relief, and number two, we are a little bit more convinced that they're going to last longer. You know, with all the other literature we had was from the 70s, and the implants have changed dramatically since then. So I think we have a little more science behind our decisions as well as a little more science behind the uh, design of the implant itself. So I think patients are, are much happier having surgery to relieve their pain. It certainly int introduces the issue of revision, revision surgery in the future, but... Hopefully, we can um, do well enough to make this last for their, for their lifetime. We're still, um, you know, like I said, this is the hard part of the surgery. We're still dealing with getting the proper exposure for the uh, socket. And what I've done here is made a little more of a cut on the humeral side just to try to get the best view we can of the, of the socket because that's really where, um, where the meat and potatoes of this operation is, is getting a really good, stable glenoid replacement and that exposure process sometimes is step one, step two, step three and, and some people, especially in women that have better preoperative motion, you know, we would we, have been done by now, but quarter of irrigation here. So one of the things the viewers should understand and we talked about, about this a little bit already, total shoulder replacement, which as we noted includes replacing the socket and the head, uh, is very good for pain relief. That's probably the number one uh, indication uh, for people that have significant arthritis in their shoulder. Uh, it also will help with range of motion. And uh, the range of motion that it's typically helpful for is one, raising your hand up above your head, and additionally in terms of rotating your arm away from you, uh, kind of like that. In terms of reaching up your back, uh, it's a little, it's quite, it's quite significantly variable in terms of what kind of improvement there will be for that. But typically, we usually tell our shoulder replacement patients that they may not have a great improvement in terms of their internal rotation. Uh, it's the other two motions that, they're, that they have significant improvement in. Let's take a couple, while Dr. Weisler there is uh, working on uh, getting better glenoid exposure, let's look at a couple of the uh, implant choices that we have here. And I have some slides again here that show some of the choices. Uh, the first one here, this is the general, general shoulder replacement that we're talking about uh, that Dr. Weiser is getting ready to do. It's, a, it's the normal shoulder replacement that involves the, uh, the, uh, the replacing the head and the socket. The top portion of the slide uh, shows the ball portion replacement. And basically, the original designs were just basically one big piece of metal with a ball and a shaft, uh, which now we've changed that has a shaft that you put down the humerus and a uh, ball portion that you can uh, more accurately design to the patient's uh, anatomy. For, uh, for the glenoid choices, there's, uh, some diff there's been some newer designs now that help anchor the glenoid better. Uh, Dr. Weisler, these, these glenoids that you have here, do you use cement or no to keep them in place? So if you, if you look at those um, implants, they have three small peripheral holes, and those are cemented, and then we have the... Um the central hole that's actually a metal, typically I use that metal piece that you showed. That's a good view right now. And that's, he's talking about this right here. 
So uh, can I have this, this thing here? And you have that guide, uh, the glenoid guide. So for this design, you don't use cement at all? I use cement in those small peripheral holes. Okay, all right. Um, used to be, you know, even as, as recent as three years ago, we used to have only cement. Can you pull just a little bit more there? Uh -huh. Good, good. Um, and now, see, he's a little retroverted, so that's, I think we're going to try to um, maybe correct that. I'm just going to get a center point here. So what are you doing there with that drill? So this is going to make our center position for our glenoid. And um, so as you mentioned before, he has some erosion on the glenoid that's not exactly the uh, anatomy that Mother Nature put him together with. And so he sort of eroded a little bit in the back, what we call eccentric posterior erosion. Okay. And so this drill is finding us a center center position for the next step of the operation, which is going to um, ream the glenoid more con uh, a concavity that would accommodate the prosthesis. So this is really the center center position of the glenoid. Okay. So if I'll take the medium reamer if next. If you show uh, here again this, the uh, replacement that we're going to put in for the socket portion, he's drilled the center hole for this center piece here, and you can see that there's this silvery, and you, can't, you probably can't appreciate the roughness of it, but that roughness that's on it is similar to the uh, roughness that's on that, that humeral stem that I showed you before, like here. That roughness actually, again, helps provide the bone to grow into that. And then on the outside, at one, at, in, a, in some subsequent steps that he reaches, he'll drill some holes on the outer portion of the socket where these will fit in. And these ones, although they don't have the, uh, the metal coating to help bone and growth, they'll, those will be helped, helped held in place with the cement, as we sort of talked about earlier. So right now, I'm actually drilling in uh, what we call reaming the glenoid. And hopefully that's really all we can get a picture now, maybe. I don't know if the camera can see that, but we're sort of right in the center of the glenoid. Probably needs a little bit more. Harry, could you wash that for us, please? Probably needs just a little bit more to um, you see we have a little bit more of an anterior bevel than the posterior, just because we're trying to eccentrically ream it. And um, I have a small cob. This maybe can get us a, a look in the front. So one of the things, what he's talking about there with the eccentric reaming, and I don't have a great slide to show you this, is basically, the dish, if you have a dish like this, is basically flattened down in the back and it's still curved in the front. And so when they put the center hole in there for the reaming, which is basically uh, a uh, round ball with sharp uh, cuttering portions of it, kind of almost like a, uh, a colander that you use. It, it almost looks like a colander that you uh, get the water from your spaghetti from, but the outside edges are sharp. Actually, a good example of it is a cheese grater is exactly what it looks like. And uh, you use that basically to cut down some of the bone in the front part of it so that the socket is then um, even in the front and back again. So that may be a little hard to see here looking at those pictures, but the point of the matter is is that, that, sort, that what we were talking about before with the ball hitting on the uh, edge portion, you don't want that to happen. So you want that ball to sit centered in there, which won't be centered in there if, uh, if this isn't put in straight as it possibly can be put into the, uh, into the socket that's there still. So right now we're drilling the, um, those three peripheral holes to accommodate the uh, cemented portion of the prosthesis, the peg. If you could clean that, that drill for me. And I can show you that again here with the uh, implant we have. These are the uh, outside holes here that he's talking about drilling right now in the socket. All right, here's one, and we'll need another peg here in a minute. In terms of uh, some other pros prosthesis choices that are newer now, um, I'll show you a couple other slides of that. There's a newer choice called a resurfacing uh, shoulder replacement. Uh, this is sort of like the, the hip replacements that you hear uh, talked about uh, a little bit before the shoulder ones came out. Um, and these are sometimes a good option in younger folks that you don't want to uh, be making all the cuts in the bone like you saw earlier. Um, additionally, when you, when you see this design, uh, the, the replacement essentially just puts a new cap on the top, kind of like a mushroom cap, but it maintains all the bone below. Um, and so long term, if you need to go and do a, a typical replacement like that we're doing here, you can do that easily. 
The final newest choice that's, that we see, and I'll show you that on the next one, is the reverse shoulder replacement. This is, uh, this is a new idea that's come out. Um, well, it, uh, I shouldn't say it's new. It actually, the idea of it came around in the early 70s. Came around in the early 70s, and, uh, but the, design, the designs with the metal were not actually uh, as well, well designed as they are now. And, uh, and the idea of the design is it actually helps provide uh, a, a way for the shoulder to work when you don't have a rotator cuff, which we were talking about earlier. Uh, where if somebody doesn't have a rotator cuff, they wouldn't have uh, the, uh, the uh, chance to have this, the uh, replacement we're putting in here today. Irrigation, please. So we're back here looking at the... Uh, yeah, so we're just uh, finishing with those three peripheral holes. You can see here, I don't know if the camera can get a shot of that, but we got three peripheral holes. And then now we're going to get ready here to make our large central hole, which is, which is really, the uh, I think, the innovation behind this new implant. Again, Biomet uh, is a company that makes this implant. It has a really nice fixation technique for this central hole. Um, so I need the, uh, this guide and then the first large central drill. You can see here that there's uh, these are the three holes that we've just drilled. And we're going to make a large central hole to accommodate the metal post of the implant that Dr. Tui just mentioned. So those three pegs fit into the three holes we've just drilled. Get that screwed on all the time. Now there's different sizes of that, correct? There are basically a small, medium, and a large. Okay. And uh, I have done, probably with this new, with these new tools, I've probably done about 100, maybe not 100, maybe about 80. And I've probably put in about um, eight out of 10 of those have been uh, mediums. But no doubt, everybody's a little different. So we have three options. Is that drill here? And um, we try to just size it for whatever the patient's anatomy lets us do. So then we have a two-step drill here. This sort of just gets it started. And then that takes off a little bit of bone. And then can I have this large central post drill? And you have a medium. And you have the cement started getting ready here to, we're going to take a trial here in just a minute. So one of the things that you'll see during the procedure, which we haven't really gotten to yet, but uh, Dr. Weiser's getting about to the point here, is you want to make sure the things fit right. And so they have actually uh, temporary uh, sized pieces that, uh, that he'll be putting in that give you a sense of how well the, uh, the idea of the sizes will fit in, in each different shoulder. Obviously, everyone's a little different, so if you don't have those size choices, uh, you, wouldn't get, you wouldn't get the appropriate fit. And here's an example of the trial. It's just a, a temporary implant that we can coker here to uh, get a sense of what we've just done actually fits this patient. So here we're just going to try to get that to fit in our holes because this is going to be our next step with the real implant after we kind of get it dried and cemented and everything. So... So sometimes, as, as we were talking about earlier, uh, you're in a tight space during this procedure. It can be a little finicky trying to get that piece in there. Uh, and it, it really depends on your exposure, which looks like Dr. Weisler's got sorted out now, and he's got that, got that trial in there on the socket. Yeah, we have, we're still, we got the exposure. We just need to make our uh, right set of steps here. It's, there we go. All right, and that fits great. So it kind of gets a sense of its stability by press fitting that we don't want it to toggle around and it feels nice and stable. So, all right, so we'll take the medium. You can open up the medium and assemble it if you would. And then, um, then we'll get ready for the um, cement. And we'll need the um, epinephrine soaked sponge tips. That fits real well. I think it really makes a difference for folks to get the socket replacement done because I think it really affects their successful pain relief after surgery. Okay. And now we just have to trial fits in so good we can't get it out. So I guess just as a technical point for people to understand, um, people may sort of know a little bit, you know, hear the word epinephrine, but the idea with that is basically 
um, the sponges that we put in there with the epinephrine uh, help uh, stop a little of the bleeding from the bone that was trilled. Um, and, and the reason for that essentially is, is that uh, the cement is a grouting agent. And if you can imagine if you were um, using a grouting agent to put tile down, you don't want a lot of extra water around it because then the grouting will uh, not harden up as fast as you'd like. And so that's, that's the idea of putting those epinephrine soaked sponges in there. It helps prevent the bleeding. Now you can see they're basically using a, uh, it's basically a, a sort of like a fancy pressure washer that we use here in the OR to help clean things out. And the idea is to clean all the blood off the bone uh, before we put those epinephrine stoked sponges in there to prevent any further bleeding. And so we want to make this as dry as we can. I'm just checking our holes. We got good bone, good bone there in our top hole. So, so one of the things he's getting at, Dr. Weisler is mentioning there, you want to feel that all the holes have bone around it. Have the bank card retracted? Because when we put the cement into those holes, you don't want the cement going back behind, uh, behind the socket. So. Dr. Weisler, what do you typically do if you know one of those holes is in, uh, is in solid? Well, that's why, again, the, um, sometimes you can't control what the... Um the patient's anatomy has here, so oftentimes we're left with a, one of the holes may not be as optimal as we would like. A small runger, a small skinny runger, a little limper. Yeah. So um, sometimes we have to sort of accept the fact that some of these holes may not may not be a totally embedded in bone. Well, I think this one went fine. It looks like it's quite it's quite good. But sometimes uh, when that indeed does happen, sometimes we can put some bone graft in there. Uh, oftentimes we just um, sort of cement it as best we can and depend on the other ones, uh, especially with this large new implant, the large central hole, really makes a big difference for us. So um, I'm ready for those epi tapes, please, Harry. And um, you can start mixing the cement. If you have. I need a tonsil. So you've sized the glenoid. Now you haven't sized the humerus yet, is that right. correct? You have, but these are soaked in epi, right, the tips? So we haven't done that yet because that's, uh, we want to, so we get to the glenoid first and get this done, and then we'll go back to the um, sizing of the humerus. You know, we started sizing it by, with those hand reamers. We measured to a 10. I think we got to a 10. And, um, and this, we'll go back to a 10, and what we haven't done yet is taken the ball size. So we'll, we'll measure from the, um, these, the is this the, the epi-soaked one? No. I have another epi-soak. We'll also measure from the implant that we cut out, excuse me, the humeral head that we cut out, we'll get a sense of uh, what that is and try to match, you know, again, matches anatomy with what the uh, implants offer. And there's a whole bunch, we'll show you on the back table here in a minute, after we're sort of waiting for the cement to harden, we have a whole bunch of choices that give us the option of choosing different diameters, different uh, radius of radii of curvature, et cetera. So these are the, uh, this is the epinephrine soak. We just want a little bit of epinephrine on the, just at the very tip to put in the holes to try to help Again, like you said, dry it all up so that when we put the cement in, we need one more here. This just tries to get it as dry as possible so as to uh, in, in maximize the, uh, the cement um, bone interface without any fluid behind there. So we'll, we'll let that dry for just a minute while we're preparing our prosthesis. So, Dr. Weiser, what a... Uh a lot of times, folks are kind of curious to know what this stuff's made, what what this stuff's made out of. Uh, can you tell me that a little bit? You mean but, the implant itself? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good question. So this is the real glenoid implant. You saw the trial a minute ago. Um, I think they're showing some mixing on the back table there. Um, that's mixing the cement. If we can uh, look over here at the camera, you guys can come over here a second. So um, you saw the implant that Dr. Tui showed you. Those were samples. This is the real implant. You see the large porous coated metal post, and that's going to uh, be the, really the bread and butter of the fixation, the lion's share of the fixation occurs when bone engrows around this porous coated surface. The rest of the implant is made out of a high grade metal, excuse me, medical plastic called polyethylene. And you can see it has these little flutes that also helps interdigitate, interdigitate the cement fixation to the bone. So a few years ago, we just had these three peripheral holes and they really did cause some troubles in some folks, not a lot. And now we have this large central hole that's been designed. I think um, the Biomet's one company that really does this real well. Um, we have the option of taking this off and putting on an all polyethylene post, and that provides for cement fixation. So 
Um, so here he's mixing on the back table the cement, and what we're going to do is, we're, in a second here, we're going to put cement in those small three peripheral holes, and, um, and then that's going to be all for the Glen. It'll be able to direct attention to the humerus, and uh, we've probably got about 30 minutes till we're done. So, Dr. Weiser, I know there used to, people used to more regularly use a, a different kind of glenoid design, one that had sort of a keel, like on a, the bottom of a sailboat. Right. Do you ever use that anymore? You know, I did very early on. Um, th those tend to be a little less stable because of the uh, points of fixation are, are more in the longitudinal line as opposed to three peripheral points of fixation. So I think largely the keels have been abandoned by most people in favor of the... Um, um, either three peripheral holes or um, this, this one with the large central peg that I showed. Uh, it's just really uh, trying to, all these things are trying to do is to maximize the fixation and long-term stability of the glenoid. Right. Because the glenoid really has been the slow link, uh, the limiting factor in the long, uh, longitudinal, you know, really the lifespan of a successful shoulder replacement. Right now, you know, I think I can safely tell folks that this will last 15 years and um, without really wearing out because unlike a weight-bearing joint like a hip and a knee, these tend to last a long time just because they don't, aren't subject to the weight-bearing the weight, uh, bearing forces as in a uh, hip and a knee. But we haven't gone to yet. Um, can I have a sucker tip on this, Harry? Can I have that sucker, suction tip back? And, and so what Dr. Weiser was talking about is, you know, the, the idea of, you know, the shoulder is a non-weight bearing joint. You have to think about that a little more carefully in, in, in folks that may, uh, may use their arms for transfers and stuff more, and you may think about it, and that's sort of what we're getting at with folks that are young, you know, that are a lot younger. They may use their shoulders in a lot more aggressive manner uh, than, uh, than, a fo than, than older folks, you know, that are here. They're not so interested in necessarily going out and and uh, lifting weights and things like that that might put significant stress on their shoulders. And so we'll talk about it in a minute after we get this done here. We're just trying to expedite our, once we get the cement, it sort of has a time to harden. So you'll, pardon me if I'll, so I'll rush through this. I need another sucker tip, Harry. Two, two interesting points that Dr. Weasel brought up here. One, just so you guys, so you sort of understand. The keel, the advantage to the keel that most people don't use it anymore, it actually allows you to insert it more easily into the, uh, into the socket portion uh, because it doesn't have all those extra points of fixation and it's such a tight space. For the impactor for the... Human the other thing, just to kind of he Dr. Weisler uh, mentioned, is uh, the, the longevity of the uh, total shoulder replacement. At this point, the longevity, at least the statistics we have, uh, have about 85% are still uh, being... are still successfully being used by a patient uh, at 15 years, which is fairly comparable to uh, knee and hip replacements now. And right now you can see they're, uh, they're basically helping implant that glenoid so it fits a very tightly. Uh, you don't want that to be loosened at all, and they're putting an instrument in there now to check that it's, it's evenly placed all along the socket. Uh -huh. So I'm just going to give it a little more, just a little. All right, well, that's good, and that's it. I mean, that's it. Now we're done with the socket. Now it used to be we don't have to wait for the cement to harden anymore. I'm going to go ahead and take this out snow. And let me, let me remove this one here to let the arm come back into a little neutral position. All right, so that's pretty much it. We're going to now go back to the humerus. Let me just look at it this way. Can I have the facuta back, Harry? So that's really it for the glenoid, the facuta back. Fukuda, and then we'll start with the uh, humeral brooch, and you, what did you got us, a 10 there? Uh, seven, start with a seven, try to go to a nine or a 10. So if you'll hold that. And if you can lower the table back down for us, we'll go back down with the table. So one of the things you, you may not appreciate, but one of the, at this point in the procedure is Dr. Weiser will be particularly careful with the, uh, with the final implant on the socket portion that's been placed. Is that a brooch here? Uh, that portion, that permanent portion, you don't want to scratch up at all uh, because that can lead to uh, earlier wear. And so uh, this will be a little bit more of a uh, gentle, uh, careful process in terms of putting the humerus in. Uh, mm -hmm. We made a second cut, may not be exactly flat on the back surface. But it's okay. So where are you right now, and what what did you just put down there? So we're just going back to, uh, you remember at the very beginning, we used these hand reamers to uh, trial 
uh, to start reaming when we did the humeral canal before we did the cut. And now we're sort of going back down sequentially by mil millimeter by millimeter for the, um, for the real thing. So we started with a seven, uh -huh, and this is an eight. And we're just trying to get the canal size to, uh, again, to maximize the fixation on his particular native, you know, his particular size, we want to make a proper fit. And this, um, this rod here helps to line us up with the, what we call the version of his humerus. Okay. And uh, one more, I think. Uh -huh. What size is this? Where are we at? That's a nine. That's a nine. Let's, I think we're going to, I think we might want to leave in a nine. Let's try, since we went to a ten, we're going to, let's just, let's just leave this in. I think we're going to try ahead. So what have you got for us here? You got uh, let's take the orange. So you line. can ima you can imagine that when he's when Dr. Weiser mentions version, it's it's the rotation of the uh, humeral the the ball portion of the uh, of the humerus that they're replacing. And if you turned it too far towards the back of the shoulder or turned it too far toward the front of the shoulder, then uh, then it would end up putting a lot of pressure on that socket portion that we just replaced, uh, probably resulting in that socket portion to fail sooner than expected. So those, a lot, those rods, that it, that those essentially pins that you saw off the uh, shaft there, which are actually now gone, um, help make sure that the, uh, the socket the, uh, or the ball portion of the, of the uh, humeral replacement is, uh, is, is in the right position. So we're just trying at different sizes here. This also we have the ability to change the eccentricity of the head because we also we want to match up his cut. And it looks to me when I'm looking at this, it's probably hard to see, but a little bit offset, so that one already fits better. All right, so let's take that retractor out. So these are our trials, and now I'm going to sort of feel his tuberosity. There's his rotator cuff, and there's his tuberosity. So the height's really quite good, and um, I want to feel the laxity of his joint that we haven't made it too tight. Take the arm into neutral position and externally rotate to make sure it doesn't lever out the front, indicative of posterior capsular wear, oh, excuse me, tightness. And that feels quite good. So I think we'll go with a nine and then probably this um, head combination. So that's our trial. And now um, we're going to go ahead and remove these uh, trial implants and put in the real thing here in a minute. Have the brooch holder. Uh -huh. and, and so we're just going to remove these trials and uh, hang on a second. Just be careful when we just kind of do that. So you just kind of maneuver the shoulder around a little bit to tell how the fit is. Is is that is there something you know in particular when you're doing that? Is there a science to it, or is that sort of the art of uh, art there's, of surgery? There's a little bit of science to it. Uh, you know, we want again the you know the the body tissue heals somewhat unpredictably with many patients, uh, but we want to make it a little looser now than rather a little tighter. So when we have options. We probably want to try to choose what's a little smaller rather than a little bigger so that we don't, what we call, overstuff or put too much tension on the soft tissues as they heal. Because we have to cut through the tendon, he doesn't move um, the shoulder right away. He goes through a period of about two weeks to let things settle down and then starts his rehab program. So we want to make sure that everything has a good chance to heal and gets real solid. So we don't want to put implants in that are too big, too tight, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you have the uh, humeral implant. So what Dr. Weisler was talking about with rehab, I can if you if we show us the rehabilitation slide here, uh, it'll sort of outline what he was what he was uh, what he was alluding to. Uh, the rehab goes through certain phases, and the idea is in that first phase at day one, you start some basically just using your good arm to move the arm that has surgery uh, it, it, through some specific range of motion exercises, but you don't actually want uh, the, any of the muscles being used on their own and okay, no, oh, okay. So i want to show the real implant here getting ready to go in okay so here's the implant you can see the remember the uh, glenoid that we put in had this porous coated material this rough surface here allows for the bone to ingrow and afford stability this looks like it's fairly round and it is round it's got a polished surface to it but also affords for some bony ingrowth but really the stability of the prosthesis is is done by the um, non-circular shape of the proximal part as well as this rough surface. So um, again, we try to kind of not touch as much as we can to let this go in. And then we line up this rod here with the form, as you mentioned before, and then has a collar on which the cut surface fits down. 
Okay, so we want that seated, this suction right there. Want that seated down pretty good. We really, since we're not using cement on this part of the prosthesis, we really want the bone to ingrow, and so we just kind of tap it down, give it a little bit of a rest. You could support the level a little bit there, Roy. And we've got about another two millimeters to go. It's kind of why we went to a nine as opposed to that ten reamer that we started with. It's about down. Another maybe millimeter or so. So just looking back at that rehab slot again. Yeah. Phase phase one, uh, as we said, has some passive some basically some stretching exercises to do, kinda like if you're trying to straight trying to stretch out your hamstrings after running. In the second part, which begins around the second, uh, after two weeks, we begin some active range of motion exercises, meaning you're starting to use some of your muscles to move around the new uh, shoulder that you have. Around the four to six week mark, uh, you start doing resistive exercises. And the idea with that is that you're starting to do some strengthening of uh, the muscles that have gotten a little weak from, uh, from, from following the appropriate rehab protocol. And then, at the and then at about 12 weeks, usually your shoulders, mo most folks have reached a point where they've gotten close to the maximum amount of uh, range of motion they're going to get, and they're fairly strong, and they're usually quite happy at that point in terms of the shoulder replacement. So if you want to look back here, we're ready to put in the, uh, the head. Here's the headpiece. You can see we have this um, eccentric portion that allows us to, again, customize it to his fit just because of the way his bones are built. This is modular. We allow this central piece to dial to afford us the ability to offset the head. And then we have the size that was based on the trial that we just put in. So we're gonna try, we're gonna dial this with a little bit of the eccentricity posterior and a mallet please. And then we just kind of give it a couple of gentle, gentle taps. I'm gonna test it and I can look at again, the size sort of fits his anatomy or height it's good based on his tuberosity, and, and basically that's all. I mean, we're done. Now we're going to close and refix his rotator cuff, but um, that's essentially it. So um, we have a couple of conclusion slides to talk about, but uh, thank you very much for joining us. We hope this has been informative for the uh, viewers, whether they be physicians or patients or physical therapists or the general public. Uh, we hope this has been informative. You can see the uh, incision here, about four inches or so. We'll close uh, layers by the um, rotator cuff, followed by the soft tissue, and then the skin with an absorbable suture uh, so that there aren't any staples to make as a cosmetic incision as possible. So uh, that concludes the operation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Weisler. Thank you, Dr. Tui. Appreciate your assistance. And uh, while the folks in the operating room, this truly is a team effort. You know, we depend on anesthesiologists. We depend on therapists and the nurses and the... And, uh, we have Roy Cardoso as our fellow here, and Snow is a medical student. All these folks really make a big difference in, um, in getting the best result. It's really a team effort. Well, thank you. All right. We'd like to thank everyone here at Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center, and especially the viewers for uh, taking part in this webcast. Just a reminder, if you missed any portion of this webcast, or would like to watch it again, it will be available in the archive. For Dr. Ethan Weisler and Dr. Christopher Tuohy, have a good day. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Dr. Wiesler again, uh, thank you for joining us. Just wanted to give you a few conclusion uh, statements about our procedure. We're just finishing with the uh, closure, just finishing with sutures and bandages. He'll be in the recovery room shortly. Generally speaking, folks after this surgery are in the hospital for about two days. Some people go home on day one. Uh, today's Tuesday. Uh, our gentleman may go home tomorrow or Thursday, as the case may be. The Anesthesiologists have put in a catheter in around the shoulder muscles and nerves that help anesthetize his shoulders so as to make his post-operative uh, course relatively pain-free. It minimizes the uh, side effects from the anesthesia as well as it minimizes some of the um, post-operative pain that he may have. And then uh, about day two, they take the catheter out. He goes home on regular uh, prescription medications for a couple weeks. He has his arm in a regular sling. Most folks can uh, start driving in about two weeks. Even with your arm in a sling, you can eat pretty normally. You can take the sling off in about three or four days to shower. Just put your clothes on and just dress uh, with normal clothes and just put the sling back on afterwards. The, re the closure that we do is stable enough to allow those simple 
below the shoulder level activities. And then we, we generally recommend uh, everybody to go to see a physical therapist. Physical therapists are critical in this post-operative period to work on the rehabilitation. And each rehabilitation, as Dr. Tui mentioned from the slides, is done with a sequence of steps. So as to protect the shoulder early, but keep some gentle range of motion. And then over the next uh, you know, 12 weeks or so, every week allows for an increasing set of steps in terms of range of motion and active strengthening. And uh, usually a pretty uh, set vocabulary and protocol that the patients and the therapists work together with. And then generally speaking, depending on the amount of stiffness, most, most patients take about a year. Really, it's fully a year before people are better to the point where they can do whatever they want to do. So surgery itself took us about an hour and a half. Uh, the gentleman did very well. We had no troubles, and uh, he'll be in the hospital a couple of days and should go home and, and start his therapy. So hopefully this has been of some benefit, again, for the physicians or therapists or patients that may be tuning in. We hope this has been of benefit. Um, we hope that there's uh, um, information that may guide you in your decision-making in terms of uh, deciding on shoulder surgery, and we hope that uh, you find this useful and choose uh, Wake Forest Baptist. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching this OR Live webcast presentation from Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. OR Live makes it easy for you to learn more. Just click on the Request Information button on your webcast screen and open the door to informed medical care. OR Live, the vision of improving health.